Welcome to Breaking Math, the podcast where we not only prove theorems, but also look at regressions, policies, and procedures in the world of data visualization. I'm your host, Autumn Finaf. Today, we're joined by Dr. Jonathan Schwabish. He's an economist, writer, teacher, and data communications expert. He is considered a leading voice of clarity and accessibility in how analysts, researchers, and scholars communicate their findings. Across four books, he has provided comprehensive guide to creating, communicating, and distributing data-rich content. Better Presentations coaches people through preparing, designing, and delivering data communication products. Elevate the Debate helps people develop a strategic plan to communicating their own work across multiple platforms and channels. Better Data Visualizations details essential strategies to create more effective data visualizations. His most recent book, Data Visualizations in Excel, helps readers create better graphs and charts in the Excel software tool. So stay tuned to listen to what good data looks like on this week's episode of Breaking Math. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Baker's, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Baker's worth it every time. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. Hi, John. How are you doing today? I'm well, Autumn. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on the show. Now, tell the guests a little bit about what you do behind the scenes at Policy Viz and also your career as a data analyst and economist. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's a long, it's a, it's a long path, so we'll keep it, we'll keep it short because uh, we got a lot to talk about. A lot of fun stuff. <laughs> of yeah. course. Yes. Yeah. I'm trained as an economist. Um, I did my, my schoolwork here in the States at the university of Wisconsin and Syracuse university. Um, I spent about a decade working for the congressional budget office, which is, uh, uh the based on the budget arm of the U S Congress. And while there, kind of towards the end of my tenure, I started to get, I think a little frustrated with, how I think the media wasn't really using a lot of the analyses and reports and things that we were producing. And even like members of Congress weren't using it. It was just kind of frustrating. And so I started to think about, you know, what is it? Like, how can we get our stuff to stand out? And this was like in the pre-social media days, right? So th- you had sort of more, you know, kind of legacy media. You had you had sort of dedicated channels. And um, it turns out there's this whole world of data visualization, of people actually thinking carefully about how to communicate your data, which is something that, like, I don't know, I was never exposed to in any school, like certainly graduate school. There's never any talk of like, how do you present? How do you write? How do you speak? How do you make good graphs? Like it's just not part of it. And so I um, got, I dove head first into this, into this world, uh, met some great people and then just started making things and, and pretty quickly realized that like, if you just spend a little bit of time um, thinking about how your reader or user or, or audience member, whoever it is, how they are going to use it and what they need, you're just going to make better stuff. And so I'm not a designer. I'm not a developer, web developer. I, I'm, you know, again, I'm not a communist. So like, um, but all you have to really do to start is just to think about what people need. Like maybe they don't even need a graph. Maybe they just need a table or maybe you've been showing them tables, but they need a graph. Like that's the sort right. of thing. It's just like strategic thinking. Um, and so I was there, I worked at CEO for a long time, and then I moved to the Urban Institute, which is a nonprofit. Um, I'm based in Virginia, but the Institute's in, in DC, so right across the river. And um, yeah, I, I still do economic research, mostly on nutrition policy and, and disability policy. And then I started my own side little hustle, as the world is these days, uh, uh, Policy Viz, where um, I do similar sorts of work, um, you know, consulting with folks, building tools, um, you know, uh, writing, all, all the sorts of good stuff, having my own podcast. I mean, all the stuff, Autumn, you, you know how it is. Like, yep. always, 
always it's par right? for the course. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> One right. thing helps the other helps that's the right. next thing. That's and... right. That's that's work in the, in the twenty twenties is just a constant constant uh, hamster wheel. So yes, um, yeah. I mean, I, I I come to this world again not through a design eye, not through a kind of computer uh, science eye, but through the I guess I would say the data, the research eye, and recognizing i think that a lot of folks who also come on that uh, same journey that same path don't think about the other pieces of the puzzle right. i think more so now uh than in the past clearly i mean the, the the tools that we can talk about later the tools are better the browsers are faster the media organizations have accelerated how important data and data visualization is than their and their workflow. So there's a lot of reasons why I think people are more attuned to it than, than they were when I first started. Um, but it is, I think, at its core, if you're thinking about how do I get my research, my data, my analysis, my math out there so people can understand it, like the visual, we know visuals work and you don't really have to, again, be uh, get an MFA in design. Just think about what is your, you know, that key person, that key group, that key stakeholder. What do they want to see? What's going to help them do their job better? What's going to help them find insights? And once you sort of identify that, the rest is is really just gravy on top. Definitely. Now, I've done data, whether it's been in my courses or, you know, just in working, right? So everybody's a scientist. Everyone talks about good data. What exactly is good data? Ooh, that's a really good question. And I guess it, it's going to be, I think in, in some ways, it's going to be specific to the sector or the, the, the field or the science, right? But right. I would say, in general, what is good data? I mean, I think good data is, has, now we're not going to get into all the statistics here because we'll, we'll be here all day. It'll be super fun. We'll, we'll, we'll be here all day. Um, we it's like a, numbers here. We do like numbers, right? So what? So what is what? What constitutes good data? I mean, I think first is it's the sample selection is neutral and objective. Um, that doesn't mean it doesn't have outliers or it you know necessarily follows a normal distribution. Um, but the sample itself is is not biased. Um, uh, you know, we understand who did the survey and how the survey was conducted um, and how the data were collected. I, I, I really do think that's an underappreciated part of working with data is understanding how things are actually collected. I mean, we Definitely. know, I mean, we know right now, I'm not, again, I'm telling you all the things I'm not. So I like, I'm not a survey methodologist, but we know that people answer surveys differently if it's pen and paper versus on the phone versus on their cell phone as a, you know, typing in versus on their desktop. We know those are different. We know people uh, answer questions differently depending on the order of the survey, depending on what the options are and individual questions. So really understanding the data that you're working with and how they're collected, I think that's really the key. And, you know, it, it, it's a kind of a tricky question. I mean, I, we're, we're like end of August here we're recording and just a few days ago, the Bureau of Labor Statistics came out with like massive um, uh, revisions to the unemployment rate data, like massive sure. revisions, right? And so, if you said to me, "Yeah, the bla do, you know, do you think the Bureau of Labor Statistics has good data?" I would say, "Yeah, it's like it's the best, right? Like they are the best." And then they have these massive revisions, and I don't think that means that they're being or bad. It just means like if I use those data. Three weeks ago, I'd have to redo my analysis now because the data have not changed. So I think, I guess, part of this is depending, again, on what you're doing and what your sector is and what your goal is. Data is kind of a living, breathing thing. And you have these changes and updates and edits, and, and it's it's hard to, you know, keep track of. And it, I mean, it's, it's hard work. I mean, I guess I'll, I'll end it there for folks who are, you know, maybe who are just getting started in the data world working with data and it doesn't matter if you're, you know, a school teacher looking at the survey results of parents or, you know, you're downloading data from the Census Bureau. It's all hard because all these questions apply. And I think if you're getting into this journey of, of being a data person, I think really understanding what the data are, where they come from, how they were collected is really the first step. 
Sure. Now, what are some of the most common mistakes that people make when creating data visualizations? So, so I, I struggle here because it's a really, it's a really interesting question, but I think my, like a lot of people's knee jerk reaction to that, to that question is here are some specific rules, right? You need to follow this rule and not follow this rule. But, but data visualization is interesting because it's a little bit of a combination of art and science. And so there is the science of it, particularly around how you use data. There's also art. So how do you put rules around art? So I think that's like, you know, I, I would just, I would just caveat my answer with that. So I would say, instead of, I will give you one rule. This is the only rule that I believe in and that, okay, well, let me, let me pause for one second. Like, should pie charts sum to 100%? Yes, yes, they should sum to 100%. Is that a rule or is that common sense? I, I don't know. Like, I kind of just feel like that's common sense. But if you want to call it a rule, like, okay. The only rule that I really believe in is that bar charts, horizontal or vertical, should start at zero. The axis should always start at zero. And that's because the way we read or understand a bar chart is by the length of the bar. And so uh, the thought experiment that I like to do is create a bar chart of just two bars and imagine the increments on your y-axis are each, say, an inch, and calculate yep. the height of the bars when the bars start at zero. And now start to graph at something other than zero, have the same inch height on each increment, and recalculate. And what you'll find is that you have this overemphasis in the heights of the two bars. So just a little bit of math can get you a long way here. So what you know? What else makes a good graph? I mean, for me, I look for a few things. In, in, in visualizations are sort of like the things that perk my ears up a life when they like warning signs. I guess I call these warning signs for people like trying to distort the lie. Things like percent change when maybe the levels are meaningful, right? If you say, oh, this thing grew by 300%. It's like, okay, yeah, it went from one to four. Like, is that meaningful for one person to four people? I guess. But maybe that's not meaningful, right? It no. depends on your population size exactly. and the data, it, right? Right, exactly, exactly. So it it totally depends. But like, uh, you know, those that's the sort of thing that like, especially if it's not a topic I'm particularly well, especially if I am familiar with it. But but also if I'm not familiar with it, like, okay, are they showing me the percent change because it's you know we're starting with a small baseline and maybe that big growth doesn't really matter. So that's one. Um, log scales. Um, not that I think log scales are bad. It's just, you know, a lot of people have a hard time interpreting log scales. And so you don't see them a lot, but that's, but that's one. Um, another one that I love, and I have so many examples of these, uh, is when people overlay regression lines on scatter plots. Cause it's so yeah. easy. Like autumn, I feel like, it, I feel like you and I can, could talk about this more, but like, absolutely. Right. Like, it, it's so easy to be like, oh, here's some polynomial, and now you've got this weird line that makes zero sense. Or the opposite, where it's right. just a linear one, right? Or they just figure out what's the line of best fit, and it, it's just not going yeah. according to the data. Yeah. I mean, there, there's all, like, that's the thing about regression models, right, is you can you can play around with the model, and then, I mean, you know, a, a, a dishonest person can get a model to fit and they can say, oh, I ran a regression. And lots of people are like, ooh, that's pretty fancy. But you're just. But what you're does just it kind of mean? Lying. Right. What does it mean? Yeah. Right. You're just doing kind of lying. Yep. Um, and then I guess the other one, this is sort of just a general one, um, but comes back to the board chart point is anytime someone has made an arbitrary decision in their graph, this is sort of just like a general one. An arbitrary decision to me is the one to look out for. So the bar chart not starting at zero is a great example. If you start your bar chart at something other than zero, you've made some arbitrary decision of where to start. You started at 34% or $699. Like, that's arbitrary. And so why did the person do that, right? Um, a really good example is uh, there's this website uh, – and I don't actually know if he keeps it updated anymore, but it's this uh, this guy's named Tyler Vegan. It's v i g e n dot com. It's called Spurious Correlations. You're nodding, so you know this site. This site I, is great. Yes. And all he does is create these dual axis line charts, so one line to one axis, another line to another axis, and just plays with the ranges and scales of the axes, so that these lines look like they're lying on top of each other when you know they're seemingly totally separate trends. But yeah, again, you like. 
you, these arbitrary decisions about what range you're going to use, what min and max, what increments you're going to use, you can make things kind of look the way you want them to look. And so those are the things that are that are like that I look out for when I'm when I'm looking at people's visualizations. Especially when you're doing policies and procedures and you need to make those decisions right then and there. Right, exactly. So yeah. do you have another example that can talk about data visualization and how that has a significant impact on policy decisions? Yeah, I, I have a couple. I mean, it is a little tricky, right? Because you want to be able to say, it's kind of like to our regression point, right? Like you want to be able to say, here's a graph that affected this thing that affected this outcome. And life just isn't that that simple. So impact in that way is hard to measure. But I, I will tell you this story. I I made an infographic, which is like, you know, infographics back in the day were like these big tower things or combinations of graphs and text and pictures and all this stuff. And I, I made several of those and, and and discovered, I think pretty quickly that people just weren't even reading these tower infographics. There was just so much to scroll through. It just wasn't, it just wasn't natural. So I, I made an infographic that um, accompanied a, a, like, I don't know, 150, 200 page report for at, con, uh, for, at CBO. It was just eight and a half by 11. The whole point was to print it. CBO, members of Congress like paper. So like, let's, I mean, back to the very beginning of this conversation, right? Let's make things that meet people where they are, right? If, if, mm -hmm. if you're in a print town, print stuff out. If you're in a, you know, an area where there's not broadband, your big old dashboard ain't going to work. Sorry. So like meet people where they are. Um, sure. So I made this, uh, made this one page infographic and, um, we delivered it to, you know, to members on the Hill. And a few months later, the director was, was testifying and the ranking member of the, of the, of the committee, like held up that printed infographic with like his scribbles all over it. Yeah, exactly. It was like pumping my fist. I was like, this is amazing. Cause I like, get again, this. <laughs> yeah. You're like, okay. So like, does that mean you know, there's this particular outcome. No, but you have provided the information to the person so that they, they can use it. Look, like I, I am by no means saying members of Congress are uh, dumb or can't read, although I could maybe make that, just take that argument, but like they're busy people. Yeah, <laughs> they're busy people, right? They've got a lot of stuff on their plate. And so they're not going to read a 150 page report because they have to read say, 12 of them a day. Right. So like right? you're thrown so much information yeah. and policy. And I would say even sometimes in academia, when you're teaching, you're making quick executive decisions, even as a CEO or COO of a company. Right. Yeah. Sometimes you have 501 things. What is the simplest form of data or policy or procedure that's going to come across yeah. and just be like, here, look at this picture. Right. And that's what clicks. That's what sticks in your head. Sometimes yeah. it's not all of that fine text that yeah, you I mean, have if to you're, read. Yeah. If you're the CEO of a company, you don't need a 150 page page report to dive into the data. That's what your employees are for, right? At the exactly. end of the day, they're, they're bringing you the recommendation or the answer or, or whatever it is, right? So like, here are the five numbers you need to know. And, and again, it's not a knock on anyone's intelligence. It's just the way the world is that we have lots of competing demands and depending on your role, again, you might be the the budget analyst for organization XYZ and your job is to read the 150 page, but yeah. maybe the president of your organization, they're also not going to read it. And you know, that's okay. We've all got lots of things. So um, yeah. So this, this, you know, this one pager, again, it wasn't like, Oh, he has this one pager and therefore we got this outcome, but it was clear. We made this one pager and he read it and he used it and he took notes on it. And that's, that's a fist pumping win right there. Right. That's, yep. that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get information analysis data into the hands of the people who can use it. And, and we do that the best we can and in a clear, objective, useful way. And then we hope that they go on and make the right decision. Definitely. Now with that, where do you see the role of data visualization evolving? in the next five years, maybe even the next decade? 
Yeah, I mean, I think the first answer has to be how is what's going to happen with the AI, right? I, mean, right? I think that's the that's the first clear question, clear answer. Um, you know, a lot of data visualization work is done through code, done in programming languages, R, JavaScript, Python, uh, Svelte, several others. Um, you know, uh, uh, AI makes the coding task easier. Uh, it does. You know, you just, you know, right? I mean, just like, hey, write me a code that does this thing. And, you know, I use it for a lot of uh, my actually stuff when I do like... College Savings Iowa is now iSave529, and it can do more than take your child to college. It's their passport to a bright future because funds can be used for K-12 tuition, trade schools, graduate degrees, books, and everything they need to get anywhere they want to go. Register by September 30th at iowa529contest.com for a chance to win a $5,290 contribution. iSave529 for every child, for any adventure. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Baker's, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Baker's worth it every time. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply more advanced stuff in Excel. I use it to write VBA code and like, it's generally right. Like, I mean, you know, so I think that's the, that's the first place, but uh, certainly on the coding place, I think we're already kind of almost there. Then I think the next question is how does AI get embedded or integrated into the data visualization tools? This is already happening. You know, Microsoft has their co-pilot tool. Tableau has something similar, um, but how does it get integrated into the tools where you can say, you know, Hey, Here's my data, show me six options or six variations. Or, okay, great, uh, show me that bar chart you just created uh, using a style that, you know, Autumn would use, right? Like, I mean, that's that's the right. that's the capability it's going to have, right? Or, you know, okay, make that bar chart in the, in the form that, you know, The Economist or The Washington Post would, would make it in. Um, you know, I think that sort of almost the low hanging fruit in some ways. Um, I think a lot of tools kind of already do that. I think the next stage is how is AI going to enable, how is AI going to help us see more and better insights into the data, right? Especially um, if it's complex and yeah. with a lot of different trends, it could, it could show you a lot of patterns that, you know, you're not picking up yourself. Right. And and I also worry, I mean, we know there's bias built into these tools already. And I worry a little bit about, you know, if, if you know, again, the tool doesn't know the quality of the data, so it's just going to use the data as if this is right. So there's that caveat. But I think it's also, if you're asking the tool to uh, get, or, or I guess be informed by other sources or other resources, what is it pulling from? Like, what is it looking at? Um, what other literatures is it reviewing? You know, if you're going to say, you know, I want to, I want to now analyze these 12 variables. What are some recommended models, right? Mm -hmm. What is it pulling from? Like, what is the, the research basis that it's, that it's reviewing, right? Is that biased towards, you know, um, we can make it simple, like U.S. research versus U.K. versus Asian, you know, research in Asian countries. Um, is it just looking at certain fields? You know, like there's a lot of questions, I, I think, there. Um, and, and I'm curious to see, I think the other thing that I'm curious to see how things will evolve in, the, in terms of the future of, of data is, is how our um, our technology, uh, not just our AI technology, but like our physical, like our phones in particular, like how are our phones going to change in the next several years that will either facilitate or not facilitate our use of data in different ways. And when, by that, I mean, um, we saw kind of in like the early 2000s into like the, you know, early 2010s, like this real huge increase in people making interactive data visualizations on every website, every bar chart, every line chart was interactive. You could click, you could swipe, you could do all this stuff. And then start, folks started to realize like, okay, everybody's on their phone. 
no one's like filtering and searching. So we don't need, no one's clicking. So we don't need like all this fanciness. Let's go back to static graphs. And then the phones got really big and then they got sort of smaller again. And so where, where are we going to end up in the next few years? Right. Like in terms of size, speed, different platforms. I mean, you know, and then, and then I guess the last thing I would say is, you know, where is augmented reality, virtual reality going to fall into this? Um, I've seen some really interesting use cases um, and there's a lot of research going on around the world and especially in AR um, to kind of give like this, I don't know what, I don't know what, I don't know what these folks would call it. To me, it's like, it's almost like virtual tactile visualization. So I can actually like take the part, like it's a minority report, right? Where I could take the yes. part, I could zoom in, right? In the, in the sort of in the air, right? So is that- It's where more interactive. Yeah. And it's not, and it's not mouse based. And there's some, there's also some advantages there from an accessibility perspective, right? If you're unable to use a mouse for lots of different reasons, right? I could break my arm tomorrow and not be able to use my mouse. um, But I might be able to use my hand to zoom in and zoom out and pan and scroll. Yeah. I mean, I think there's some, there's some interesting use cases uh, there. And so, you know, there's a lot of interesting things that are going to happen. And we'll just, you know, I, I'm not scared of the Terminators yet. So I think, you know, we're, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see. I think something that you haven't really thought about also is with large amounts of data is going to be the security mm-hmm. that you are going to have to think about. Are these going to be, you know, we, we just saw Microsoft have a whole collapse with their system. Right. For all the transportation for airplanes uh, yeah. globally. So what does that mean uh, for even Google, right? Yeah. So our largest platforms are Microsoft, Google, and well, there's Apple. one other. Okay. And um, most most government things are on Microsoft. Other systems are, and even if you're talking about crypto, it's AWS. Right, right. So... That that really brings in some questions of where's the security going to lie? Is it going to be in these systems or are they going to be smaller towers that are like stored for mm-hmm. companies when you're doing all this data, right? And I didn't I didn't back up from that, right? Because if you're worried that your data is at risk, are you as willing to answer a survey? Right? I mean you know, so, so it, it, I mean, yeah. the Census Bureau had, there are federal laws on the books that say what the Census Bureau can and can't do to protect people's privacy because they know if they say, oh, yeah, we're just going to share all of your information, you're less likely to answer that survey. So if right. our data is at risk through not the Census Bureau's fault, but through how data are stored and shared and, and that sort of thing, um, are people just going to be more reluctant? to answer surveys and that's going to hurt our data quality. So there's, yeah, there's a lot of, and, and, and I focus on the, I, I keep mentioning the census bureau. I know because um, that's just, you know, where, where my world is, but you know, if you're, you're going to do the school, the, 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 the school teacher one, if you're, a, if you're in a school teacher and you're collecting data on, Oh my God, if you're collecting data on kids and your data are stored yep. in the cloud and that data is lost or hacked or revealed, like, you know, there's a there's a lot of of um, considerations here about data privacy that, that medical um, systems. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, and it's hard and it's hard work. I mean, this is hard stuff to do and to do it well. Of course. Now, with that, what are some of your favorite tools or software for creating data visualizations? Ooh, okay, so that's a great question. Um, uh, I'm going to, I'll tell you my, my, the first one I use, and a lot of people are going to cringe, um, but I use Excel for a lot of my work. I was um, going to say, I knew that you were, that was the first thing that was going to come <laughs> out of your mouth. I'm like, I almost yeah. wanted to have a flash card. Well, I mean, you know, uh, and a lot of people are like, oh, Excel's the worst. Excel makes bad database. Like, first off, Excel doesn't make anything. Like, we it, make the stuff. Yeah. Right? Like, we still control um, Excel has a couple auto functions, which yeah. are not fantastic all yeah, the time. Yeah, I mean, look, it's good for what it's good at. If right. you need to make a bar chart for your report, Excel's great at that. Um, I would never use it to like 
make some sort of interactive data visualization for a website, but that's not what it's for. So I think there's, when people talk about tools, they get, I think a little bit too much in the like, uh, you know, what's like objectively the best. And I think it's, again, just kind of use case and, and audience. But I'll, I'll say I have, a, I have a few that I do use. So I use Excel a lot, a lot of the time. Um, I use uh, the R programming language um, yeah. for particularly for maths. Um, I will say I'm not a great R coder, um, but that, again, is what's great about knowing lots of people who do lots of great work. You can always lean on your friends. So that's that's great. Um, uh, so I use, so the library in, in R is ggplot. So I use ggplot for, for maps and then um, some other graph types that are relatively easy to grid in R. Um, I do use Tableau for some dashboarding work. Um, and then I, I, I'm sure people would be like, why not Power BI? Um, Power BI, for those who know, is like the Microsoft version. I yeah. think it's it's fine, but it's not on the Mac. And I'm a, I'm primarily on my Mac, so... Sorry, like Apple and uh, Microsoft, like get over it. So we can get the Power BI and the Mac and like more people can use it. Um, and then there's two, at least two other tools that I use fairly regularly. They're both based in the browser. So on um, your point about data security, like these are tools you would not use with like secure data. Yeah. Um, because it's saved into the into the cloud. But um, there are two tools, Data Wrapper with a W and then Flourish, um, the mm. Flourish data visualization tool, both are really nice tools. Both are based in the browser. Both have pretty broad um, uh, libraries of, of graphic types. Um, and what's really nice about them is that you can create a graph, you can grab an embed code, drop it on their site pretty quickly. That way it's responsive to different sizes. You know, it has, the, they both have interactivity with them, but like, okay, if, you know, if it's going to, if it's going to resolve the response, the responsiveness issue that like a JPEG or a PNG is not, then I'm kind of willing to have a little bit more clickability on it, even though I, you know, may not need it. So, yeah, I think that's like five tools that I use. I'm not, again, I'm not like a web designer. Uh, the tools that that our data vis our data visualization team use at, at Urban uh, for a lot of our online immersive storytelling, scrolling things uh, is JavaScript, which is particularly D3. Yeah. And then um, also Svelte is the other one that they're using with a lot of things like Node throw in there, Node.js throw in there, and a bunch of other things that I do not code in. So, um, but yeah, there's a lot of data viz tools out there, but those are the ones, those are the ones that I, that I pretty much rely on. Those are the ones that you get a little more interactive on the website. So yeah. So if you go, like, if anyone goes to, like, the New York Times or Washington Post or really any, like, major news organization and there's some sort of interactive visualization or, like, we scroll through and something animates and move around, it is almost certainly built in D3. Yeah. Um, which, again, is JavaScript. Um, almost, almost certainly. Um, so, uh, which, again, like, you know, if you can code in that language, uh, more power to you. And again, like, so, so I think here's like the flip side, right. Of the, of the Excel makes bad data viz. Excel's good. What it's good for. You wouldn't use D3 to do the analysis, right. Cause that's not what it's good for, right. You would do yes. your analysis and, and then you, that's a data visualization. Book. Same thing. Um, uh, here's an, another good example, flourish and data wrapper, both tools. I really like, they are not spreadsheet tools like Excel. So you can't like load your data into either of those tools and say, oh, okay, I want to multiply this column by four. You you have to go back to your your data tool, which could be Excel or R or whatever tool you use, and then bring the data back in, right? Those are data visualization tools. And Excel, and it's the reason, one of the reasons why I've I've always used it is you can do your analysis and your visualization right there in the same uh, uh, same environment. Um, and uh, I know lots of people who are like, well, that's what R is for, and you should do it in R, and programming is more scalable and more reproducible. And and I don't and I and I do and I totally agree with that. Uh the only caveat I guess I would add is a lot of the folks that I work with um uh tend to be like small nonprofit organizations or advocacy organizations. And like they have a data person and the data person is the data person because they like showed some affinity of working with like Excel or Google Sheets. Right. And so that's what you know, happens that person, with a lot of cases. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that person's not going to like go learn R. They have to do their day job. Um, 
And, you know, they're not going to be able to hire someone to do that. So everybody has Excel, you know, pretty much everybody knows how to make the basics. And so my goal in, in helping folks with Excel is just to show them how to push the boundaries a little bit, because the, the rules in the matrix in the matrix in Excel are like the matrix. Some can be bent and some can be broken. And so, um, that's how I sort of, uh, that's how I sort of approach the, the tools world. Yeah. No, sure. I totally <laughs> get that. Um, out of curiosity, how do you think policymakers can be better trained to interpret data and use data visualizations? I mean, I guess are, are policymakers any different than anybody else? Okay. How can right? anybody? Anybody? Yeah. I mean, when I tell folks, because a lot of the times when I teach when I teach data, one of the things that I lean on is showing people lots of different graph types because we all right. know line bars, pie charts, bar charts, right? Because we learn those in, I don't know, whatever, third, fourth, fifth grade. It's not like human beings have the bar chart DNA strand, right? Like we have to learn these. So, um, I mean, I, I think about, you know, my graduate work, my undergraduate work. Again, no one taught me how to make good graphs or how to make good presentations or how to write well. I think part of what we need to do in the education, especially in sort of like the advanced degrees or, or, or and, and there is to teach people how to be good communicators, right? And it's not just data viz, like again, how to be a good writer, like how, how to, to be, be a, a good, good storyteller. How to be, yeah, like all these, and it matters for every job you're going to go into. Like if you're, I don't know, I have a, a friend still who, who's still CBO, um, and she manages multiple people. And she's like, it shocks me how these, you know, early career folks come into meetings with me and they're unable to like have like a meeting. And I think like being able to communicate in that way, and that's not a presentation in front of an audience of 5,000 people or 100 people. It's a one on one presentation. And that's Absolutely. a skill. Yeah. I mean, my, uh, I have uh, my oldest, uh, my oldest. Uh, kid is in uh, is a senior in high school, and uh, you know one of the things, and you know she has lots of friends who have already gone to college. And one of the things that we we've been talking to her and lots of others kids as they go into school is like, and we hear this from a lot of the admissions officers at, at schools, like don't be afraid to go talk to your professors. Like you you should go to office hours, like even if you don't have a burning question or a problem, because talking to professionals, talking to your professor, talking to senior people is a skill. Um, and I'm sure there's lots of educators who listen to this, like talking, you know, students talking, it's a skill you have to learn. It is. I find that to be crucial for networking, especially I, so some, some of the classes that I taught were 150 freshmen in a course, that's, 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 right? That's, 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 Biomedical yeah. engineering, 150 that's, freshmen, yeah. and fresh out of high school, never interacting with somebody. Uh, yeah. You get these professors that come in older, uh, I'll say older, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, 50s, 60s, yeah. very professional, and seem kind of harsh and unapproachable. Until you get the op in their office hours, they're sitting cross-legged on the desk saying, right. hey, what's up? Right. Um, right. And you don't yeah. get that interaction until, what, eight weeks in the semester? Right. Or or even if they are more formal. Like, yeah. you're going to graduate and go into the workforce, and you're going to have a boss who walks to the – some boss is going to walk to the office with no with no shoes and socks, and another boss is going to wear three-piece suits every day. See, and, and I've had professors – I've had yeah. no professors with no shoes on. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 that I'm not a fan of. I'll just, I'll just say that right. There. I don't want to see your feet. That's, I'm just putting that out there right yep. now. Um, but I think you know, you, you asked about policymakers, but I think it's really anybody. And I think especially if you're, you know, young, early career, particularly college students, um, you know, or, or even you know, high school students, like go talk to your teachers like that. And that skill, you never perfect that skill. Right. You just become a better communicator. You're able to mm -hmm. have conversation, be able to guide conversation, learn how to, you know, have facial, you know, uh, uh, you know, look in people's eyes. I mean, I think the technology we have, which is great, 
you know, we have these supercomputers in our pockets, but, you know, we sort of lost, I think, a little bit of that face-to-face communication skills. And um, those are still necessary. And, um, and so essential. I think you, yeah, they are. They are essential. And so, you know, yes, I would love for us to, uh, I would love, for example, for calculus to be uh, way less emphasized in high school and for statistics and probability to be way more emphasized because, you know, calculus is for the engineers and for the economists, but for most people, most kids are not going to need calculus, but everybody needs, needs to statistics. understand how probability works. Everybody, you know, you know, we're in the midst of a presidential election here, right? Everybody needs to understand that when you see 42% and 41%, that those are statistically the same thing. Right. And, and, you know, calculus doesn't really help you do that. Um, so I would love, you know, I would love to add data viz into that because I think that makes for a more educated, more data literate society. Um, but, uh, but to, to, I think to your point, uh, Autumn, it's just about being a better communicator and that takes practice. And, right. and I don't think you can start early enough about learning how to communicate with people. Now, what ethical considerations do you take into account when creating visualizations for policy purposes, for procedural practices, or just to an audience? Yeah. I mean, this is an area that I've been thinking a lot about uh, in the last few years, particularly starting with the racial justice protests uh, in, in spring of 2020. Um, and there are a variety of ways that I think about this, and, and I think there's sort of like... The simple. Is your vehicle stopping like it should? Does it squeal or grind when you brake? Don't miss out on summer brake deals at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Baker's, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Baker's worth it every time. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply to the more complex and the simple not that it's easy to do but sort of like maybe the more straightforward is the best better term is like what words do you use to describe people and communities right like do you describe yep. people by their skin color or do you say you know hispanic employees or asian students right as opposed to describing people like as their color um and i think you know, like a, uh, an interesting one that we see this change over time is like moving towards people first language so we use like pe people with disabilities rather than disabled person right yes but there's nuance and subtlety and evolution in language that makes like coming up with like a rule really hard because there are lots of uh groups and people who prefer the identity first language like disabled person right autistic person um i have an example in my notes somewhere of um there's an organization that works on behalf of autistic people and they surveyed their members and like 80 something percent of their members said that they prefer identity first language rather than peer person first language. So these are like really hard questions. Um, but the overarching, I think, thread through um, this body of work that I've been doing at the Urban Institute for the last three years or so, which we call our Do No Harm Project. So they have about six, seven reports on this. Um, the the sort of thread that pulls through everything is to just have empathy for people, which I think is just like a good rule of thumb, just yes. living. Um, but for data and data viz, is would you like? Here's the thing that I just I just tell everybody: like, would you feel offended if you were represented in that way in the chart, the graph, the diagram? Like, if you were described in that way in those words, if the color in the graph was assigned to you as a person, how would you feel? If you're represented in that icon of that person, how would that make you feel, right? And if, I think that's a very, I was going to say simple, but it's not really that simple because we all have our own experiences. Um, so it'd be hard for me as a, you know, as a white man to sort of, you know, know how, you know, a, a black woman would feel in seeing a graph in this way. But 
you I, I think you know that's what empathy is and you try to just put yourself in someone else's shoes um and think you know the, the thing that you can do is say okay is this icon this graph this word let's make it my identity is that how i want to be described or shown and that's sort of like the beginning and then you kind of move into more depth from there so how are you going to order the bars in your bar chart or the entries in your table? Are they going to put white and male in the top row or the first bar, which is how Census Bureau products are. They put white is always option one in the race question on race. Yep. So we don't have to follow that ordering. That's just that's just based on structures and institutions we've had in this country for you know 200 years. So can we maybe think about, well, maybe I should order it based on the the magnitude, you know, sort by the bar height or sort alphabetically or, you know, another one that's not, you know, I mean, every survey that the Census Bureau does on on gender, um, they're all binary, by the way, it's always male and female, and it's always coded male is number one and female is number two, which is not alphabetical. I mean, I guess it's it's binary, so I guess it's out, but it's not alphabetical in the way we think about it. Yep. It's not alphabetical and it's not, um, it's not ordered by population size. So it's just saying... Well, men go in the first position. And, you know, I think that's how we can start to think about being more equitable in, and inclusive in, in the work. And I'll just say here, like, I do get people who push back on some of these ideas that, you know, it's just, oh, it's just woke and it's just, you know, liberal, blah, 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 blah. And, I, and I'm happy to take an ethical, moral stand on these issues, but I'm also happy to take kind of like a capitalist stand Right. If I'm selling a product, um, I want more people to buy that product. And if people feel respected and they feel valued and they feel like you are being empathetic to their lives, their experience, they're more like, I mean, I don't think you need science to know this, right? They're more right. likely to buy your stuff if they feel like you value them. And um, so, you know, I, I'm happy to fight on both those hills, but. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess I would just kind of like wrap up by like, I mean, like the empathy piece is what kind of drives all of this. And that and that gets you a good chunk of the way there. It's just thinking, how would I feel if I was shown in this way, you know, this icon of this, like an icon of a woman in a dress with a pink, baby pink color? Like, is that, is right. that how we want to represent, you know? Is that everybody? Women? Yeah, right. Yeah. Is that everybody? Is that how we want to represent people? Do like, we want to uh, talk about the history of pink that goes with it? It was oh, a man's color originally. You know, okay. <laughs> yes. You know this book? Yes. Yes. So The, the Secret Saint Lives of color. of color. It's so, fabulous. Fabulous book. And I I have, I'm kidding you just mentioned it. I have my bookmark on the chapter on pink because she talks about how it used to be flipped. Uh, prior to like the mid, like post World War II, it was flipped. It's the artist in me, okay? It's That's the secret behind the scenes. Yeah. I am also an artist, not just a mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> but that stuff, that stuff is like these hidden stories, right? are just fascinating. Right? Yeah, yeah. Now check um, out the next one is the color green. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know how far they go in. I don't remember how far they went into the book. I was flipping through it, but green well, is... everything. Yep. Royalty. Yeah. But also now uh, green is a trustworthy color for businesses mm -hmm. and brands. Right. So if you take it from like uh, not just having purple for um, a lot of Europe as royalty, a mm. lot of the immigrants even into the 90s to 2000s, uh -huh. especially from Portugal, Italy, Spain they would drive green cars when they came to America mm. because wow. in America, they were building their wealth, right. especially having an immigrant family. You were building your wealth and yeah. that's, that's some of the unspoken language. Right. I mean, it's color. also interesting, like just the cultural differences in color. Yes. Right? Like in, in Western civilization where like red is stop bad you know, negative. Whereas in Eastern cultures, it's the exact opposite. I mean, I, I've always, I, you know, my work is almost entirely U S focused, U S domestic focused. And I've always 
like felt bad for people who work at like some international organization where you have to make like this chart has to work for your U.S. Everybody. audience and your European audience and your Chinese audience. Like that has got to be so difficult to think about. You know, your colors really matter and uh, and, and are and just interpreted in very different ways. And that, right. that's just a huge, huge challenge. Not to mention back to the equity piece on like accessibility, right? Like accessibility is also an equity issue. And so uh, the data viz world, I would argue and have argued lots of places that the field is a little, I think a little, over overly focused on color vision deficiency like in yes. particular red green but with lots of types of, of disabilities and impairments that impact people's ability to understand information or to use computers or to use definitely paper or whatever it is right um i did uh uh oh i've been doing this project at work the, uh it's a data physicalization project so it's like it's making you know, making graphs with physical things. So it's like, here's a, a map of the United States uh, in post-it notes, right? So each state is a post-it note. And here's a disc, little wooden disc, like put the disc on the state that you were born in, something like that. So we make these fun little graphs. And uh, as part of some some more research into that, I spoke to a bunch of folks who do museum installations. And just thinking about the the variety of challenges you need to consider, right? How are kids you know you're going to build a a, a table right in the yep. museum of natural history how are kids going to be able to see it how is someone in a wheelchair going to be able to see it um is the room going to be light or dark like i mean there's just so many variations to think about um definitely it, it's really just kind of a fascinating science fascinating area now uh behind the scenes of what you just you do on a daily basis you also have policy viz podcast yeah Tell us about it, oh. because I know that a lot of folks here, we do have a large audience. Um, yeah. We do different things, more engineering side, but also a lot of these people are in policy. They're in government and mm -hmm. engineering and yeah. also higher ed. So right. the stuff that we do is this also the things that we can learn from you. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so yeah. So, thanks. Yeah. My, I mean, my show is really talking to folks in and around the data visualization field who are focusing on how do I communicate my data better? How do I communicate my data to have impact? Um, so lots of uh, authors come on the show. Um, uh, the One of the guests I had at the end of, of my last season uh, was Georgia Lupi, who's uh, really well known for her sort of bespoke visualizations. Uh, she had a really, she uh, she had this incredible story in the New York Times about long COVID um, that was kind of look like um, like uh, uh, paint brushes, like different yep. different swatches of paint. It was just, just beautiful work. Um, oftentimes I'll, I'll try and get people on who uh, can talk about tools, like specific like tutorials and how to build tools. Um, I'm going to talk to uh, someone from Envivo uh, in the fall, right, which is the qualitative data uh, yes. data tool. Um, I've talked to people who use R from Posit, uh, the Posit uh, 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 company to talk about how to use R. With doing data visualization and working with people in policy and communication, and I'll even throw in educators, science yeah. communicators, yeah. what is the biggest thing that you want people to take away from this podcast, from this episode, and also learning about more data in general. Okay. And also yeah, I, listening to your podcast. Yeah, well, obviously. obviously That's yeah. obvious. Obvious, yeah. I think, and this is this is nice, because this is kind of where we started, right? So it's like, first right. of all, I think the thing to start with is who is your, who is your audience? What do you want them to do? What are the insights you want them to find? What are the discoveries you want them to make? How do you how are, how is your work going to help them learn better, do their job better, wh whatever you want them to do? And if you could just think really hard about your audience, and and a lot of this is just a, is an evolution. It's a journey. You you put stuff out. You see what works, what doesn't work. You see what your audience needs, doesn't need, what they use, what they don't use. But I think if you start there a lot of the other stuff sort of falls into place. And that's, um, and a lot of this is also just um, 
learning and growing and trying and changing. I mean, I get asked a lot to teach like data is, you know, 201, like a 201 class. And I'm like, yeah. the 201 class is just doing it. Like you just gotta, you just gotta get in there and do it. If I'm not going to teach you a tool, how to code in this language or how to build a dashboard in this thing, if we're just talking about core principles of data viz there is no 201 201 is just doing it man you got to get out there and you got to try it and some of it's going to work some of it's gonna, not going to work but i promise people that if they think really hard about who they're trying to reach and even for 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 your educators right i mean all the educators who are listening to this you know who have taught at different grade levels know that sixth graders ninth graders and 12th graders learn in very different ways right and so yep. they know that instinctively and so we you know the rest of us have to learn that, that that it is about knowing who your audience is and and the rest of it i think just kind of falls into place wonderful thank you john so much for coming on this episode of breaking math thanks autumn that was a lot of fun it was a pleasure having you College Savings Iowa is now iSave529, and it can do more than take your child to college. It's their passport to a bright future because funds can be used for K-12 tuition, trade schools, graduate degrees, books, and everything they need to get anywhere they want to go. Register by September 30th at iowa529contest.com for a chance to win a $5,290 contribution. iSave529 for every child for any adventure. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Baker's, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Baker's worth it every time. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. College Savings Iowa is now iSave529, and it can do more than take your child to college. It's their passport to a bright future because funds can be used for K-12 tuition, trade schools, graduate degrees, books, and everything they need to get anywhere they want to go. Register by September 30th at iowa529contest.com for a chance to win a $5,290 contribution. iSave529 for every child, for any adventure.